Hello listeners, today we will be discussing on the emergence and development of sociology as an academic discipline. In the first chapter, I am sure you have already studied on what is sociology and how is it that sociology emerged, right? And what is it that sociologists do? Now, let us try and understand and we did in the last chapter touch upon how is it that sociology emerged as a discipline, right? Now, what we will do in this chapter is we will look at the emergence of sociology in a more systematic way and not only will we look at it the world over, we will look not only will we look at the development of sociology the world over, but we will also try and understand it in the context of India, right. As, I, as you already know that there were certain social forces namely the renaissance and the industrial revolution which led to the emergence of sociology in the late 18th and the early 19th century, right. Now, this period of history is often described as the great transformation which led to the emergence of sociology. And the emergence of sociology actually coincided with two significant revolutions that is the industrial revolution and the French revolution, right. Now, if you understand the industrial revolution, then what you will understand is that the industrial revolution in the 18th century was actually not something which was just confined to one year or two years, right. The impact of the industrial revolution in the 18th century was widespread. It spread over an entire century and as I am sure you know a century is roughly about 100 years, right. So, the industrial revolution in the 18th century was actually a set of developments that transformed western societies from agricultural to industrial systems. As a result of the industrial revolution, a large number of people moved from agriculture to working in the factories. So, that means what you had was you had a large scale migration of people from the rural to the urban areas. You also had not only the emergence of cities, but also the expansion of cities, right. And all of this actually created a host of problems that as you already know attracted the attention of the early sociologists, right. Now, as far as the French revolution is concerned, the French revolution was also very significant in 1789 because due to the French revolution what happened was that for the first time you actually had the emergence of a democratic state, right. For the first time actually the slogan a government of the people, by the people and for the people was coined. So, that means for the first time you had a democratic society, you had a democratic state and obviously these two revolutions led to the emergence of a society which was completely unprecedented. Unprecedented meaning a society which one had not seen earlier, right. Now, this obviously attracted the attention of the early sociologists and as you already know that August Comte in 1838 was the, for the first time coining the term sociology and the classic theorists of sociology from the late 19th to the early 20th century actually include Herbert Spencer, Ferdinand Tonys, Emil Durkheim and Max Weber. So, that means early sociologists were to be found in England that is Herbert Spencer, Germany that is Max Weber and Ferdinand Tonys and Emil Durkheim who was a Frenchman and even Auguste Comte was a Frenchman. Now, as far as the early sociologists were concerned, they looked at society from an evolutionary perspective. That means, they tried to study everything in society. And you see by the term evolutionary perspective, what I mean is that they were looking at how is it that societies had emerged. And if you are familiar with history, then you would obviously know that this was also the time that you have uh, Charles Darwin, the famous scientist who actually wrote a book called The Origin of Species. Now, in The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin was looking at the origin of biological species. He was trying to understand how is it the different species on this earth have evolved and that had an impact on sociology as well. That is why I said that the early sociologists were evolutionary in nature. They tried to study everything in society. So, that means it was also encyclopedic. Now, prominent amongst them was August Comte and as far as Comte is concerned, August Comte believed that human life passed through distinct historical stages. They were the theological, the metaphysical and the positive. Now, you see the term theological means that this is the time when religion dominated. That means this is the time when man used religion to explain things. Metaphysical is the falsely scientific stage, falsely scientific stage in which man is looking at things from the point of view of 
false science. That means, man believes that he is being scientific, but he is not really being scientific. And then the positive phase, as, as I am sure you already know that the positive perspective was one in which you are trying to study society from the method of the natural sciences. So, that means, man was feeling uh, positive in nature, there was science which was dominating. right? And further for August Comte, you also had um, Herbert Spencer. Now, as far as Herbert Spencer is concerned, Herbert Spencer a Britisher believed that societies were to be compared to a living organism. Now, if you are talking about societies being compared to a living organism, that means you are using the organic analogy and very much like Charles Darwin, Herbert Spencer to believed that we have to understand societies from the point of view of how is it that there are interdependent parts in society. right? Now, prominent amongst the other sociologists, you also have Karl Marx. Now, Karl Marx, I hesitate to call a sociologist because Karl Marx's reach was widespread. So, that means he is not merely a sociologist, he is actually a philosopher and a thinker. And as far as Karl Marx is concerned, uh, Karl Marx, you know, did not actually look at societies as August Comte or Herbert Spencer did, his way of looking at societies was completely different. Now, when I say his way of looking at societies was completely different, what it means is that Karl Marx believed that a society's economic system decides the norms, the values, the mores, the religious beliefs as well as the nature of the society's political and governmental and educational system. Right? Now, as far as Karl Marx is concerned, he believed conflict is an inherent part of society and it is because of conflict that change in societies takes place. And change in society actually takes place because of change in the economic systems of society. That means, change in society because of economic development. right? So, that means, what Karl Marx believed was that societies for example, he believed evolved from ancient to the uh, feudal to capitalist and then finally, socialism and communism. So, that means, societies, the nature of society was determined by the nature of economic production. right? Now, you also have Emile Durkheim, a French sociologist, who is also considered to be one of the founding fathers of sociology. Now, as far as Emile Durkheim is concerned, uh, Emile Durkheim was a sociologist and I do not hesitate to call him a sociologist, unlike the fact that I was hesitating to call Karl Marx as a sociologist. right? Why? Because you see, Emile Durkheim actually was teaching sociology in the universities in France and he wrote a book called The Rules of the Sociological Method. Now, in his book, The Rules of the Sociological Method, Emile Durkheim very clearly tells us that the task of sociology is to study social facts. Now, a social fact, he again tells us that a social fact is something which is a part of everyday life and a social fact has to be studied in a scientific way. So, that means, Durkheim was very much along the lines of August Comte following the method of the natural sciences. right? Now, Max Weber completely different from Emile Durkheim and Max Weber was in Germany and he was very critical of the kind of methodology which was being advocated by Emile Durkheim and his contemporaries and his and those who were students of Emile Durkheim. And Max Weber very clearly believed he said that look as far as sociology is concerned since we are studying society since we are studying social interaction how can we possibly use the method of the natural sciences instead we as sociologists have to study society from the point of view of the social actors that we are studying right so that means our task as sociologists for max weber was to study social action and social action is action which is meaningful action, right? meaningful action in the sense action to which meaning is attributed. Now, let me give you an example to illustrate the difference between the method used by Emile Durkheim and Max Weber. Say for example, if I say the sentence bus full hai. Now, those of you who speak English or you speak Hindi, you clearly understand the sentence bus full hai. Now, somebody like Max Weber would say this sentence is absolutely correct it is absolutely correct because all of us who are a part of a society in which we are speaking Hindi and English or English if I can use the term, if we are speaking that sentence then it, it is something which we can all understand. 
But then somebody like Emile Durkheim would say, of course not, this sentence is completely wrong. And the reason why this sentence is completely wrong is because this sentence does not fit into the rules of either English grammar or Hindi grammar. And as sociologists, if we are being scientific, then we have to follow the correct method of analysis. So, you see the difference between Max Weber and Emile Durkheim, right? So, for Max Weber, you know, one very famous statement which is often attributed to Max Weber is that you do not have to be Caesar in order to understand Caesar. So, that means if I have to understand you and if I was following Max Weber, then what I have to do is I have to mentally put myself in your shoes. So, if you are a student who is let us say living in a village in South India, then I have to put myself in your shoes mentally in order to understand the society in which you are functioning. Right now, this was how sociology was developing around the globe and this is you are talking about you know till about 1920s because Max Weber is 1864 to 1920. Now, this had an impact on the development of sociology in India because you see the development of sociology in the west coincided with the French revolution the and the industrial revolution that means coincided with the period of turmoil and upheaval. Right? Now, many of the early sociologists who studied society from the point of view of understanding society was also they were also trying to understand society from the point of view of the betterment of society. Right? Now, in India too the emergence of sociology is actually attributed to the Britishers who were studying the Indian society in order to better society, better society from their point of view. So, the term betterment I am using in within quotes right? and so that means in short what I am trying to tell you is that in India the study of society emerged as a need for smooth governance of the native Indians by the colonial masters and the development of sociology in India can actually be divided into three phases. The first phase 1769 to 1900, second 1901 to 1950 and then after 1947 that is after post independence. right? Now, let us begin with the foundation of sociology in India 1769 to 1900. You see the Britishers realized that there was a need to acquire knowledge of India for a smooth administration. right? They felt that it was their task to better understand society that they were trying to govern and a better understanding of society would lead to a better governance and this was the beginning of sociology in India. And in fact, in 1774, William Jones, a Britisher, founded the Royal Asiatic Society of Bengal in order to study nature and man in India. In 1807, Francis Buchanan carried out a survey of the people of Bengal. 1816, you have a French missionary called Abe Dubius in Mysore who wrote a book called Hindu Manners and Customs. Right? Now, the first census in India was conducted by the Britishers in 1871 by the Britishers in order to better understand the society in India. And in fact, Herbert Risley in 1916-16 wrote a book called People of India and this was the for, for the first time that some, somebody actually wrote on the caste system in India. So, you see the reason why I am mentioning these names is it gives you a fair sense of what is it that the Britishers were trying to do. You have somebody like William Jones who is founding the Asiatic Society of Bengal. Then you have Francis Buchanan who is carrying out a survey of the people of Bengal. Abe Dubius is writing a book on Hindu manners and customs. right? Then you have Herbert Risley who is carrying out uh, a study on the people of India in terms of the caste system. So, that means the Britishers were trying to understand India and why Bengal? Because you see the Britishers for the first time actually started, I mean they were very, the East India Company for the first time was very well established in Bengal if you remember a bit of your history. So, that means the Britishers were trying to study the Indians so that they could better govern them and they were very clever because what they also did was with the help of the Sanskrit scholars in India, they actually prepared a book on Hindu law which was used by the British judges. And in fact, what is very interesting is that what you found was that the early Britishers whenever there was a court case, they always had uh, one of the traditional uh, you know Sanskrit scholars sitting next to them so that they could pass a judgment based on the Hindu law. Right? So, this in several ways laid the foundation for sociology because sociology as you already know is the study of society and the Britishers were studying society systematically and scientifically. Right? Now, 1901 to 1950 as I had said 
is a second phase of development of sociology. And this point, at this point of time, you know what you also begin to find is that the Britishers have now moved away from the early study, and they are also, uh, you know, beginning no, beginning to train Indians to study society, right? So, for example, you have W. H. R. Rivers actually did his field work amongst the Todas of the Nilgiris. This is actually a tribe in India. And this study was carried out from 1901 to 1902 and was published in 1906. W. H. R. Rivers was also chosen to start the first department of anthropology in Calcutta University, but he died in 1921 before he could join. Right? And uh, W. H. R. Rivers was also hugely influential in the development of the kind of sociology which was practiced by the early sociologists like G. S. Gurye and K. P. Chattopadhyay, right. And then in 1914, you have Patrick Giddes, another Britisher, who became the first chairperson of the Department of Sociology and Civics at the Bombay University. And Patrick Giddes was a city planner and a human geographer, right. Now, so that means what you are seeing here is that we begin by studying the caste in India, carrying out a census on the Indians, writing on their customs, etc. And we have moved on to establishing departments of anthropology and sociology in India. To begin with, you have the Britishers heading the departments and then you have the Indians taking over, right. So, that means you are talking about the professionalization of sociology in India. In the Bombay University was carried further by G. S. Gurye, who succeeded Patrick Giddes in 1924. Now, G. S. Gurye was a very interesting and a very learned man. Why? Because you see, G. S. Gurye was a trained social anthropologist. He had trained at the Cambridge University. He was also a sans Sanskritist. He was also an Indologist, and he was uh, also a historian. So that means, G. S. Gurye's work addressed a wide range of themes. Right? It varied from caste, race, tribes, cities, civilization, and several of his students like. M. N. Srinivas, K. M. Kapadia, I. P. Desai, Y. B. Damle, A. R. Desai, M. S. A. Rao had a great impact on the development of sociology in India, right. And as far as the Calcutta University is concerned, if you remember I had said that you know W. H. R. was died, he could not take over. Now, what happened was that in Calcutta University, you have B. N. Seal and B. N. Sarkar, who were two of the leading sociologists of their time established at Calcutta University. At Calcutta University, you also have, um, you know, you also have Bose starting the first department of anthropology there. And R. K. Mukherjee and D. P. Mukherjee were again both trained at the Calcutta University and they taught sociology at the Lucknow University. Then you also have S. V. Ketkar, B. N. Dutt, who were again, you know, specialists in Indological studies, Indological meaning studying India. And they, they trained in, in the United States, and then you have K. P. Chattopadhyay again, a social anthropologist training in the United Kingdom, and some you know some of these people are very well known names in the early development of sociology. So that means the development of sociology in India was hugely influenced by the sociology in the Western countries, right? And several Western scholars, majority of them initially from the United Kingdom and Europe and later on also from the United States carried out a lot of studies in India. Similarly, many of the leading sociologists in India had been trained in the United Kingdom and the United States. So, that means what you are saying here is that during the time that we attained independence, right? that means that 1947 as far as the uh, development of sociology in India is concerned, you have the departments of sociology and anthropology in Bombay, in Calcutta, in Lucknow and all of these were to begin with were started under the chairmanship of western sociologists and anthropologists and then the mantle was passed on to Indians. right? and Indians who had been trained abroad under the western sociologists, right. So, that means what you are saying here is that the professionalization of sociology in India was influenced by the west. Now, post 1947 that means after independence what you have here is you again have uh, you know a further growth in the professionalization of sociology. G. S. Gurye whom we have already mentioned in the context of uh, the Bombay University was, uh, the, was the first to actually start the Indian Sociological Society in 1951. 
R. N. Saxena organized the first All India Sociological Conference in 1956. Now, these organizations merged together that is the Indian Sociological Society and the All India Sociological Conference. They merged together in 1967 and they established also you know the Indian, Indian Council for Social Science Research ICSSR in 1969. Now, post 1947, you also have the emergence of M. N. Srinivas. Now, M. N. Srinivas was again hugely influential in starting the first de departments of sociology in the Delhi University. And in the 1950s and 1960s, the sociologists were studying, were carrying out micro level studies of the caste, of the joint family, of village communities. And you see the reason why they were carrying out studies like this was because obviously post 1947, the focus of India was on development, right. And as Gandhiji had said that India lives in the villages. So, the focus of these first batch of sociologists who were hugely patriotic was to study rural India and therefore, bring about development in India. So, you have S. C. Dube, M. N. Srinivas, all of them carrying out village studies, right. Further, you know they also established journals of sociology. The Indian Journal of Sociology was started in 1921 by a British, by a British professor at uh, Baroda College and this was Alban G. Vijri, uh, right. And the Indian Sociological Review was started in 1934 with R. K. Mukherjee as its editors. Now, these journals had a very short life, they were not very popular. And uh, now, uh, these days we have the sociological bulletin and we also have contributions to Indian sociology and we also have the journal of social change. The other journals in which you will find you know articles on sociology uh, are the economic and the political weekly. You also have the journal of R rural development in the 1980s and you also have a journal called urban India and the Indian journal and you know later on what happened was as India developed, as sociology developed, what started happening was you started moving away from uh, village studies to studying phenomenon like gender as well, right. So, you also have the Indian journal of in gender studies in which you will find sociology articles. Now, um, you know you already know that with independence India started its five year plans and the focus of the five year plans was social development of the masses, right. So, during 1970s and 1980s, several social research institutes were established in different parts of India. Also, many universities started as establishing interdisciplinary departments and many of them were also focusing on women's studies. Most prominent sociology departments and social research institutions are located in Delhi, Bombay, Ahmedabad, Jaipur, Chandigarh, Pune, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Trivandrum and also Lucknow. So, that means what we are saying is that the development of sociology the world over was being imp was impacted by the founding fathers of sociology Karl Marx, Emile Durkheim, Max Weber who in turn impacted the development of sociology in India because early sociology in India was early sociologists in India sorry were trained in the west right. And to begin with you have the Britishers heading and starting the departments of sociology and anthropology in India later on being taken over by the Indians and early sociologists who were Indian studied villages, right. Now, then you also have the emergence of the five year plans and then during 1970s and 1980s you have the emergence of several research institutions, fine. Now, you see you as sociologists with independence until about 1970s, 1980s and in fact, I would say late 1980s, early 1990s. Focus was on agrarian studies, village studies, um, you know maybe a bit of urban sociology. Also several new areas emerged like for example, the sociology of medicine in which you were looking at healthcare, hospitals and uh, you know uh, also religion. These were some of the areas which sociologists were working on and writing on extensively. Caste, class, changing face of caste, all of these were areas of interest. But one area which had been neglected so far was gender. So, what you have was, so that means sociology so far had been written from the point of view of men. And there was now you know late 1980s, 1990s, there was now a need felt to remove women from the margins of society and mainstream them. So, what happened was that sociology very systematically started developing a field of study in which the focus was on women, right. So, it means you started understanding 
that we need to study society from the point of view of, of women as well. So, you have the emergence of feminist sociology. Feminist sociology actually or feminist theory rather developed in three waves. The first wave focused on suffrage and political rights that means, the first wave of feminism was focused on women getting equal political rights, voting rights. Second phase on social inequality between the genders that means, women started pro protesting on the inequality which existed between men and women right. And the current of third wave actually started looking at gender from the point of view of globalization, post colonialism, post structuralism, post modernism. So, today when you are talking about gender, you are not just talking about men and women as two genders, instead what you are saying is that you need as need to as sociologists also recognize the fact that not only do you have heterosexuality, you also have homosexuality. Not only do you have men and women, you also have transgenders, right. So, you also have the emergence of the LGBT movement, LGBT meaning lesbians, gays, bisexuals and transgenders. So, you see sociology today has actually travelled a long uh, distance, long distance from beginning by studying only rural areas, agrarian sociology to even looking at the LGBT community and also trying to study you know the impact of the internet, impact of uh, the new ways of communication right. So, what you have is that sociology today is actually available to you across across universities not just in English, it is available to you in regional languages as well and you are studying a wide variety of subjects. So, you could be looking at environment, you could be looking at industry, you could be looking at uh, let us say politics, you could be looking at uh, communication studies, you could be looking at gender studies, you could be doing just about anything as far as sociologist is as far as a being a sociologist is concerned. So, that means, being a sociologist today in India makes you a global citizen. You as, you as a sociologist in India are also a sociologist of the rest of the world. Why? Because you are studying all aspects of society using different perspectives and your area of study is now no longer limited just to India. You could be sitting in India and looking at the impact of let us say for instance, the internet on communities anywhere in the world. You could also be carrying out diaspora studies that means, you could be looking at Indians settled abroad and what, what is it that uh, you know what are the what are their dynamics. So, that means, what I am trying to tell you is that the emergence of sociology uh, in the west, the emergence of sociology in India has covered a wide distance and in fact, today there is no aspect of social life which is unexamined by sociology. It is a dynamic field of study, it is practical, it is applicable to all of us in several ways. Thank you. हिंदुस्तान के हर कोने में नौजवानों के पास प्रतिभा है उन्हें अवसर चाहिए NIOS देता रहा है युवाओं को अवसर आगे बढ़ने का NIOS से पढ़ने वाले इन युवाओं ने किया है संस्थान को गौरवान्वित दिव्यांगों ने बनके दिखाया है सबल और आत्मनिर्भर NIOS के साथ आप भी जुड़िए NIOS के संग